Welcome back to Just Giants with Grump and the Cranky Fan, the best damn podcast for the best damn football team. I am your host, the Football Grump. With me, as always, is Mike, the Cranky Fan, and it's been another action-packed week of Giants off-season stuff. Non-stop, Grump. Uh, greetings from Boston this week. Uh, my my tour of the Northeast continues. Um, yeah, I mean, this is the time of year where we're, we're going grocery shopping and we're, we're getting the... Uh, you know, we're getting the groceries, as Bill Parcells used to say, to help the cooks uh, prepare the meal. Yeah, and um, I used to call throwing up shouting groceries. So that's something completely different, <laughs> but still that makes me laugh of, every time I think about it. That will be part of Just Giants trivia. Oh, <laughs> well, I, mean, I don't think any of the deals are shouting groceries level deals. So, I, I mean, you and I, we didn't think the Giants were going to be super active in free agency this year. I would argue they're still not being super active. But what they're doing is they're doing a lot of, um, I guess, like patchwork stuff that gives them flexibility, right? Yeah, I was going to say like foundational work kind of. You know, they're not trying to get the fancy, you know, drapes for the, um, for the windows or the very fancy wallpaper or anything. They're just making sure that... There's floorboards. The, the floorboard is there, and that way we don't, you know, put our foot through the floor and end up, you know, breaking our legs. So, yeah, I would agree that have with that. Be done, and they're they're taking that approach first to make sure that depth is handled, you know, no glaring holes are, and then you know they'll they'll go for the high ticket items more in the draft and via trade and and, and you know after cut down day. Yeah, so I guess. It, it's like, you know, if you, if you need floorboards and you know that there's going to be, you know, California Redwood at some point in the future, but you're not 100% that you're going to be the first one to get there, you might as well get floorboards to start <laughs> for now. And then come the day, hopefully you get the ticket that gets you the no, California like Redwood. Bob shows up and wants to really make your house nice. So. Is he still yeah. alive? I believe Bob Vila is still alive. I don't think he's on TV anymore. That's but... pretty incredible because that's like my whole life he was on TV. <laughs> um yeah so bob vila uh, hey, bob, and and, and here we are congratulations bob, bob vila the the new york version is joe shane um and he's going around adding little pieces and dovetails and other construction words i'm sure i can pull out of my ass this is, um well what what they're doing in you know to kind of finish that little thing is that we are not trying to make just splashy hires just to create a buzz you know i, I don't think the no the, the goal of Joe Shane is not to be on the back page every day of the New York Post. Let the Jets do that. You know, that that's their game. It's always been. They're the ones who have the commercials trying to sell tickets to Giants or not. They're the one who has the inferiority complex to Giants or not. Let them make moves that appear splashy, but they honestly make you a better, you know, franchise, you know, for sustained success going forward, which is what the Giants are trying to do. So they signed three year, three guys all to one year deals, and to me that's what this is, right? This is covering your bases for this year. So mm -hmm. when it comes draft day, you're not forced to pick the guy that's filling a hole for the most part. I mean, they still have some holes where I don't know what else they do, but and you're, um, you're and you're bridging to to the, the next year. Yeah, stuff. everything is. It, these are signings to kick the can to the next draft because that is how this team is being built. Correct. None of these free agent signings. With the exception of higher ceiling guys like Bobby Okereke, um, Darren Waller, I would even say to a certain extent Paris Campbell, I would mm -hmm. say those guys have the potential to be part of this, but they're already writing into the contracts just in case they're not, we have a clean way out. The safety so, outs. Yeah, yeah and, and so – Really, the true building here, the true investments into this team are happening with the extensions to like guys like Daniel Jones, Saquon Barkley, obviously. Um, and then the draft. The draft right. is and, how they're and, building and, this team. And creating the ability to extend guys who have not yet been extended yet. The guys like the sure. Jackson Lawrence's of the world who, you know, where something two years ago might have been a problem to resign them. Now at least there's the opportunity to if they choose to go that way. Um so I guess in, in a – I'm not going to do these moves in chronological order. I'm just going to start talking about them. So I guess the one that's probably the most interesting for me is they signed finally someone for the defense, cornerback Amani Oruwarie, former Penn State guy. Um, I remember doing work on him in the draft then. Uh, did, he to, play, did he play with Saquon Barkley? Ooh, good question. I, he might have. 
Yeah, I think he might have for a couple of years. There you go. Um, that's interesting. Um, but was a lion and was productive as a lion for several years and then last year fell off. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I fully understand why or that I even looked it up um, because it's not really relevant, right? Uh, and, and unless there was an injury or there were some like rumblings about like not being liked or not being a good teammate or not paying attention and being benched or anything like that, it's kind of irrelevant, right? Like Detroit, they had their middle of the season thing. They, I think they fired a DB's coach. At mm-hmm. one point, uh, that that team did a 180 right about the middle of the season. So I don't think going back to last season and really scrutinizing anything that happened is going to be too helpful. He's moving to a completely new system. There's really no – there's not a lot of blitzing systems in the NFL right now. So mm-hmm. he's going to be asked to be doing a lot of things a little differently. He's not going to have the same um, – kind of responsibilities but still young one year 1.2 million dollars 27 years old he's 6'2 205 so he's this is a man this is a, this is a big man runs 4-4 and he was productive in detroit nine picks in three years that's that's pretty damn good sure, sure um he's just he's a long ball hawking corner he's got really good instincts he's got sticky man coverage ability um i think what really really excites me is he's really good at closing so, like, if he leaves a little bit of gap, if he's in off-man coverage, he can really close that gap. And that's kind of, I think, where he gets some of his interceptions. He has, you know, obviously he has that 6'2 length to kind of jump in there, use those long arms. Um, but he also, he was just kind of in the right place at the right time for some of them, where he's in back coverage, deflected ball, goes right into his hands. But that's what ball hawks do, right? I mean, they just are in the right place at the right time. You know, I'm just sort of kind of thinking about this right now, and I didn't even prep you for this question, but, you know, on last year's roster, what is he? Q, uh, CB2? I would say if it was last year's roster that was fully healthy, so including Correct. including yes. Aaron Robinson, I Correct. think if he were on the roster starting opening week, he probably would have been CB2 because Fabian Moreau was not on the roster yet. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think Aaron Robinson would have been pushed inside where he belongs where okay. he's more effective. I think once Fabian Moreau joined the team, I'm not sure. Fabian, just being the older veteran that just understands systems, might have jumped him. But it's at least close. It's a conversation. And, you know, something that's a, that's a thing I'm going to be asking you kind of going forward. You know, this is how much show prep we actually do. <laughs> that just came up this, as I was thinking about it. It's like, you know, as we're getting guys, you know, this year via free agency, the draft, trade, unsigned free agent, cut down guy, Thinking about where they would fit last year, like, you know, w- would this guy be uh, the, the starter on this thing? Would he be, you know, wide receiver two? Would he be cornerback one or two? It's like, how are we upgrading the position with this particular signing or draft pick or trade? So um, that's interesting you say that, that he could potentially have been, you know, a starter on last year's team. So that makes me feel like we are there, there is an upgrade to the position right now. I would also say it's an interesting thought to wonder if they're considering him in a possible big nickel role. Mm-hmm. You know, at 6'2", if you have, I, I don't know, let's just say you're going against the Chiefs and you're really worried about Travis Kelsey, you know, having a 6'2 guy that sort of is almost playing safety but has man coverage ability and yeah, he can sure. also, if you're disguising coverages, come. I, I don't know. I'm just spitballing because he is a ball hawk. He did kind of do well with, you know, off coverage where he's breaking in on the ball. I don't know. I wonder what they're thinking. Um, I, I, I guess it's possible. I don't know. Well, it's something that it's something that makes an offense think about that he could potentially use that way. Too. Well, that yeah, that's what I mean. I mean, he does have, like I said, he's four four speed. He's nice and long. He's tall, and you know, he's got sticky man coverage ability. So, if he were in that, I mean, that as a potential role for specific matchups, specific games, that kind of thing. Because I don't know what you do right now with this roster. I guess you put Xavier McKinney on a big mismatch tight end, right? I, I would think so, but you know. Then that takes away the quarterback of your defense. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And that's not ideal. Yeah. It's certainly interesting, but I mean, with the deal being a, a one year, one point two million dollars, that's as good as it gets, right? This is a sure. nothing con. This this is no skin off of our backs, right? You're getting quality in the bargain bin right now. Sure. 
Yeah, these are those Walmart five movies for one dollar and one DVD. Yeah, there's a situation. pack of baseball cards in the bargain bin. I looked up and oh, I got a you know, I got a rookie card. Someone who's halfway decent. There you go. I would say the next most interesting one, and this one has me genuinely excited. This is probably my favorite signing so far. Jamison Crowder, a one-year, $1.4 million deal with only a million against the cap. 30-year-old, former fourth-round pick from Duke. Um, A former Jet, former Washington Redskin, I believe. Um, 5'8", 185 pound shifty slot receiver with vertical ability now you know he's 30 years old so he's got plenty of um experience under his belt i believe he um never played with daniel jones i think he had graduated before jones with the duke it sounds about right i mean this is what by about a year i I think it's real near miss um this dude's productive you know five years he's had over 500 yards receiving this is a five eight receiver that's, I mean, that's productive. And quite mm-hmm. frankly, whenever he was with Washington, I that wasn't super worried about him, but it was a fucking problem. You know sure. what I mean? There's like, gotta gotta find something to deal with this. Uh, goes to the Jets. He was productive there too. This is solid veteran depth. I think this provides productive and reliable depth in the event that a player that they want isn't ready or is hurt. So, you know, maybe Wanda Robinson's not 100% back yet. This is a perfectly fine replacement. Maybe they draft a dude like, I don't know, Tyler Scott pulling a guy out of my ass. Uh, they, 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 they draft Tyler Scott, but he's not quite ready for week one to take on the full role. You have this guy. This is this is perfect. It, it, somebody goes down for two games. Instead of Richie James coming in and relying on that, you have this dude who's been in the league, has never really been unemployed, I don't know how you argue with this one either. Does he have any special teams uh, ability? Like, any punt returner at all? Or? I think he might have some punt returning ability. That's a pretty good question. I believe when he started out, he had ooh, he had some punt returning. Uh, but I'll look that up while uh, you continue to talk about how important that is. It's very important. <laughs> no, I mean, who is our punt returner coming back next year? Without, Nobody. A Dory Jackson, pulling, I guess. Without pulling the mistake we made last year of having an important starter, you know, an important either – cornerback or, or wide receiver or something which we desperately do not want to do again we need a guy who might be your fourth receiver you know with the ability to you know at least fair catch a ball and you know god forbid actually make a play or two i i won this episode of stump the grump i think I'm, I'm see the thing is i'm almost positive Yes, he returns both punts and kicks. See, I just didn't want to say it and be wrong. Yes. So at the very, very, very minimum, this is the exact deal that I want. And this is what I always say. If, if you want your special teams to be an actual advantage and not just be a don't make mistakes kind of thing, then you need to invest in it. You can't just pull your starter at another position and pull all your starters to be gunners and personal protectors and returning punts and kicks. That's only going to screw up your core offense and defense. You right. don't want to do that. Uh, even if they don't get hurt, even if they're just getting banged around. You know what I mean? It's just extra knocks on guys you don't need. It's unnecessary. Yeah. And that's not, that's not their primary skill. That's not their thing. It's, right. It's like- You're shoehorning in a talented uh, athlete to do something that they don't usually focus on. And your net and your net positive return is not really there. You're not going to really notice anything. It's not a cohesive unit. Yeah, and not. you're doing all this shit for the chance at like one punt return for a touchdown, which is a game changer for sure, but the risk far outweighs the reward. Sure. If you want that, what you need to do is make an investment for special teams. Don't make an investment for your offense and defense and then try and make it do both. Right. This is perfect for that. This is perfect mm-hmm. for that. Perfect. Uh, and if that's all he ever is, this is still a good deal. It's the minimum, and it's for a year. <laughs> I can't argue with it. I, I So far, all of the maneuvering this year, I think, has been perfect. It's it's continuing to build through the draft, these little one-year deals to kind of cover all the little holes so we're not fielding, you know, nine guys on offense. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> I love this stuff, and I, I think this is a perfect deal, and it costs nothing. And... To, just to finish off, this is probably – this one, he may not be a starter. But Tommy Sweeney, tight end, former Boston College guy, um, former New Jersey guy uh, from Ramsey, Jersey, 
And um, former Buffalo Bill. Seventh round pick for them. He's going to be 28 years old. 6'4", 250. He's got the body of a typical Y tight end. Mostly a blocking tight end. But he does have some surprising receiving ability. Especially, he's really good at utilizing that whole frame. That whole 6'4". He'll scoop things right out of the dirt. Right off the tops of his shoes. He'll go up and get it. He's slower and long stridey. So he doesn't really fit what I expect out of this Dable kind of offense. Right? I mean, I think that's a little strange. Yeah. But also not signing him to be a starter and start not to be, you know, we got a Darren Waller for that. So yeah. So yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Put in perspective what he, yeah. What, he, what he's really here for. So with tight ends and we're going to talk a lot about tight ends today, obviously there's a tight end draft preview. Um, but tight ends exist in like multiple different forms, right? So you have your, your standard, Mark Bavaro, Y tight end that lines up in line with his hand in the dirt and he hits people, but then he'll also release off the line of scrimmage, go downfield and run a seam route or an out route or something. And, you know, six guys have to bring him to the ground. Mike Allstott Scott. And those are also, you know, once in kind of a generation type of guy too. So sure. those don't grow in trees. They, they certainly don't grow in trees. Colleges don't really make them anymore. no. Uh, Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's going to be a theme we're going to talk about here. But um, you get your really traditionally what you're seeing now is some kind of hybrid between that and an H back. Somebody who can do kind of both can line up behind the line of scrimmage, can split out wide, much Mm -hmm. more athletic in the open field, probably less talented as a blocker, less of a road grader as a blocker. I I, I say that Um, Mm -hmm. certainly function. They get good body position. They're just not going to dump guys too often. But they're way more dynamic in the open field. They create mismatches. That's your Daniel Bellinger. Daniel Bellinger can do both, and he does both pretty well. And then you have your Darren Wallers, which are they're just kind of receivers, right? Mm -hmm. Um, They're just bigger receivers who line up in a different position. That's it, pretty much. I guess because of their big frame, they can sort of block a little bit better than a big wide receiver. They're a little bit stockier, a little wider than your, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't know. Darius Slayton's like 6'2", right? Right. But he's not wide, so mm-hmm. he's not really knocking anybody over. Uh, with a one-year deal, this is something. I mean, this is he's going to be backing up Bellinger. He at best, I think, in the twelve tight end set, or the twelve personnel sets where you have two tight ends, I think you might get him out there um, as the first guy off the bench, maybe depending on how the draft goes. I guess question about Bellinger. I mean, is he one hundred percent since that that issue with thing with his eye? Is, is I he, assume so since he came back in the at the end of the year. Um, right, right. I, I, but I don't know because that was honestly one of the oddest injuries I've witnessed in football. Mm-hmm. Um, and also the initial prognosis was scary. I was right. like, they like asked Dable after the game. He's like, I don't know. And it didn't look good. I'll tell you that. That's why I'm curious. You know, I know he came back and everything, but like, where is he as far as like, it's completely behind him and, you know, we just move forward or is it something they're always going to have to think about? For the rest of his career, maybe. I don't know. I don't know how you could not think about that ever again. Almost losing your eye. I mean, that's probably... I mean, you're talking to a dude who has a scar right underneath his eye. Was it over here? Yeah. Um, That was a bit of a moment for me, but I was like seven or eight. So it's like difficult to fathom than when you're in a... I guess, uh, what is he, like 22? Like prime of his life? Sure. Um, And then having it all... You have the lights go out. I imagine he's always thinking about it, but you know what? That's interesting. I'm sure. I'm sure beat reporters are going to ask him as they get more access to the players in spring, not spring training. Was it called minicamp? Minicamp OTAs. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's like the very beginning of May. So we're not that far off from that. And I, and I wonder if you know if any of that has any kind of thought into you know filling this role. I mean, so that would be like, something, huh? Yeah. I don't know. It's something to think about. Um. But regardless, let's just say. Daniel Bellinger is 100%. The eye thing is a thing of the past. It's fine. He's fine, right? So now he's part of the future, right, you would say? I would say so, yeah. Yeah. Um, and Darren Waller, I know we we talked about him already. Um, a super bridge guy with the potential to be part of a longer term. Right, it? okay. Yeah. That, yeah, that's what you, you, you picked up where I was going. What exactly is he? Um and then the remaining guys here that are on the roster, Lawrence Cager had some reps, had some, had, had I think multiple touchdowns last year. Um, 
by, by that maybe two. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, he had meaningful time in games. He showed himself to be capable as a receiving tight end. He's a former wide receiver, just like Darren Waller. I would say he offers only average ability, reasonable for depth purposes. I would say the upside is probably pretty limited. Um, mm-hmm. So he's, I'm not 100% he's making the roster, right? Those guys just seem like bodies to me more than talents. Yeah. We already talked about Tommy Sweeney. He's another one. He may not even make the roster. Uh, we'll see. Andre Miller is a guy that, you know, this regime took as an undrafted free agent from Maine, a very tall wide receiver. They were converting him to tight end last year. Um, you know, not that this means anything, but in training camp, he was getting some one reps, I believe, for a brief moment before he got hurt, and that ended his season. So we'll see what that is. But he's a this regime guy, so I'm going to pencil him in as getting a competitive slot. Sure. Nevertheless, with those three guys, Cager, Sweeney, Miller, behind Bellinger and Waller, Waller, we're not even 100% sure, is here beyond this year. There's no depth here, right? Five I mean, there's, there's enough depth to get through this year, but is there really yeah, I, depth? I, I don't see, as of this moment, I don't see the tight end on the 2025 roster on this roster right now. Unless Waller, you know, works out, he's healthy, you know, they they come to a, a favorable contract terms with him going forward. But I think there's a lot of moving parts before that happens. But other than him, I see a bunch of guys that are just kind of stop gaps and just bodies. No yeah. long range planning for that. And maybe that's by design because they have bigger fish to fry. You know, they need a different, you know, they need ones in certain spots and they need to address depth in other spots. But who knows? But right now I don't, I don't see, I don't see the, 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 the path right now to the window with, with this current uh, tight end room. No, I don't either. But before we get into like the actual like players that are going to be available in the draft or whatever, um, as far as the tight end room goes, I kind of feel the need to have two different... I think you have your Daniel Bellingers to do your normal dirty work, mm-hmm. right? And then you have your Darren Wallers to be like a, a knife, right? And sure. I think I think you need both of those types of guys and you need multiple kinds just to come in and... Phil, right? So the way I'm looking at it, and I'm not sure if you agree with me because we haven't talked about this, is that I view those two things. So you have your Y and your H, and I'm just giving them those designations just to dif- differentiate between the two of them. But Wall right. is your H, Bellinger is your Y for the purposes of this. And behind that, I want a Y2 and a Y3 or whatever, an H2 and an H3. And for for Daniel Bellinger, the Ys behind him, the, in my opinion, they can be really low-end draft picks, you know, day three guys plus, or they could be the veteran guys on one-year deals like Tommy Sweeney or uh, a couple of years ago we had uh, Fells. You remember that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, same Daniel shit. Fels. Daniel Fells. Yeah. Uh, I, I would say that that's a um, that's what you would do once once you're convinced that Bellinger is your Y guy, you can fill him. You can back him up with, you know, late round guys or veterans, but with the H guy, Darren Waller, we're not really sure, and I think. Those, there's we're not a lot about the potential, but we're also very realistic about what that potential might. Yeah, but also through. like, look, if you're gonna bring almost nothing to the table as a blocker, and by that I mean, you know, Waller's not horrible. I mean, it doesn't matter. Um, you have to be like actually dynamic as a receiver. You can't just be more dynamic than other tight ends. You have to be more dynamic than the guys covering you. Wouldn't you classify him as dynamic? Darren Waller. Yeah. Yes. There you go. As far as guys in the draft available, they don't exist on day three, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Right? So the right now, you have a guy who is signed only through this year. He has no legitimate backup, right? And you're not really sure if you're even going to want him beyond this year. Right. So in my opinion, that puts tight end way up the list. And it kind of has to be somebody who is going to do more than just block. Yeah. I mean, the only other option, and the way this is the way I see it, is I, I'm not sure if you agree. Daniel Bellinger was a lot more productive as a receiver last year than I expected. If you were to get an even better blocker than Daniel Bellinger, 
you could theoretically, in the future beyond this year, kick Bellinger out to be more of the H guy than the Y guy. I think the decision on that might also depend on what else is in this offense. You know? Yes. What do we end up drafting a wide receiver one who's the dynamic playmaker? You know, is Saquon Barkley going to be on this team beyond 2023? You know, what is Daniel Jones' continued development going to be? Do you know? I, I I think your tight end one, your receiving tight end, is more going to be the product of what else is around him than him being you know the the straw stirring the drink in this offense. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see that. Mm-hmm. I also wonder, you know, in all of their offseason moves thus far, they've gotten weapons. They haven't gotten a single person that can block. Yeah. And so I, I, I take that into consideration, too. And that's interesting, too, because, you know, it's been well documented that Evan Neal struggled at right tackle last year. And a, and a tight end that could help him out would go a long way. Exactly. You know, we, we're all hoping and we're all assuming – we're going to see a second year jump and a third year jump. And, you know, this is an Andrew Thomas 2.0 where it's just rookie struggles. But what if that progression isn't as fast as we hope it to be? And, you know, who's helping him? Who's chipping on that side? Who's, you know, more than just someone who's just a quick little bump who actually is blocking over there. I think it's a bigger, you know, I, I you know, it's, it's interesting. You really, we're not going to have any OTAs or anything before the draft to see if it, if uh, Evan Neal's taking any sort of leap in practice. They can kind of say, oh, he's on the right path or being better this year or not. But um, it's something to think about with him over there until he's, you know, more established in the league and has better technique and more reps and more practice and is a legitimate um, right tackle. I believe he's working on. His stance. Okay. Um, he's working with Willie Anderson on his stance. Uh, I just I saw that uh, Talking Giants tweeted. Willie that. Anderson, the old Ram. I think so. Okay. Um, but yeah, so I mean, that it's not a secret that Bobby Johnson had them doing different things than they were used to doing. Um, so there was a bit of an adjustment there. Mm-hmm. And, That's an adjustment uh, going and, from the SEC to the NFL. Sure. I mean, sure. We, we, we said this all along. We said the same thing about when Andrew Thomas was starting, that throwing rookies into the NFL at tackle is a very difficult chore. They are going to struggle year one. We don't define them based on what they do in year one. And what do we do every single time? We complain about Andrew Thomas. Freak out. <laughs> we, we complain about Matt Pert. We complain about, you know, Evan Neal. I mean, these conversations 11 months ago we were having is Evan Neal might be one of the first two or three picks in the draft. We would, you know, kill to have him. Now all of a sudden everybody's like, you know, dump him. So relax, everybody. Um, so let's talk about the draft. On day one, I'm just going to put this out there. I'm just going to say day one. Day Do you one. think the need is really there on day one? Um I think with their bigger needs on this team, uh, no. Yeah, I kind of agree with you, and I, I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't think any of the guys are gonna go day one. Personally, I don't value them that high. But there are three guys I could see going there. I have them as day two fringe day one. That's the Utah kid, Dalton Kincaid, the who, I Notre- saw, who I did see in person and was very impressive. Oh yeah, uh, I have him as my highest rated tight end. Yeah, um, unguardable. I mean, again, the Florida defense was a sieve. But still, he was one of those guys. It was like kind of watching a giant cowboy game with you know Jason Witten just always got him open in the exact same play. And wouldn't you love that? What's that? And wouldn't you love to have that? Oh, sure, sure, sure. But again, (laughs) you know, again, again, from my observation was, you know, this is a good looking tight end, but I'm also looking at an atrocious. Hmm. You know, linebacking core and, you know, for, for Florida, too. So I, I took everything with us with a little bit of a grain of sand. But he definitely was impressive. They had two tight ends at Utah. They had another guy, too, was pretty decent. But this was – he was a better one. Yeah, they have uh, Queeth as well. Yes. Um, but, yeah, he's very balanced blocking and receiving tight end. He can do it both. So, like, if you took him, he would immediately be bookend with Daniel Bellinger and they would be a badass duo. 
Um, I mean, he's still got stuff to do, right? Like, he's obviously not perfect. I don't have him graded in the first round, but he could add some drive to his run blocking. He could clean up his route running for sure. Um, but certainly a well-rounded tight end. The the Notre well, Dame kid's you, another one. But oh, I, was you, I, I saw him in person, too. I was going to ask you a question, though. Is he the type of guy that you could see the Giants possibly trading down and getting more assets and drafting him? Like Sure. Any of these yeah. guys, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I would I would say that's definitely I think trading out of 20, 25 is just such an awkward spot where you're kind of like all the good ones are gone and all the other ones that I really want are probably going to be a little bit lower. So yeah, I I, can see I, I look at right. if, if your guy just happens to fall a little bit, you jump on it. But you're oh right. yeah, it's definitely it's definitely a portable position uh, to go down and possibly up. But yeah, more, more likely down. Uh, the Notre Dame kid Michael Mayer six four two fifty. I don't like as much as Dalton Kincaid. Um, his blocking is bad. I'm going to say that straight up. I, I don't know how people defend it. He's always just – he's not squared up, man. He's just throwing a right shoulder into guys. That does not sustain shit. It might open a hole. It might look flashy from time to time. But that's at the college – Notre Dame doesn't play anybody, man. I saw I saw him in person also. I saw him play Cal um, last year up in Exactly. Notre Dame. Nobody. <laughs> Take that, cranky wife. Um, but, um, physically he looks more impressive than what's the name from Utah, but what's the name was more impressive to me. Like what he'd done on the field. Oh he yeah. Had a he had a touchdown in the game, um, here, but it was just like, he looks better than he actually performed. I, I can understand, uh, you know, obviously I have him rated really high. Um, he's a good tight end, but I, I, truly wonder if the first of all he's going to an nfl team they're going to teach him how to block better than that but i do wonder once he is squaring up if he's even able to have the strength to block and because you know when you throw a shoulder you're just going momentum balls to the wall and you're just gonna ram and hope that there's enough time of knocking the guy off balance that it's effective as a block but when mm-hmm. you're squared up you're just gonna get bowled over if the person's stronger than you you're not getting any head of steam it's not going to work like that. So mm-hmm. I, I don't know that he's going to be an effective blocker at the next level just yet. The other guy I have rated right around this range is Sam Laporta from Iowa. He's interesting because he basically looks like a wide receiver three out there. 6'3", 245, so pretty much the same measurements as the other two guys. Mm-hmm. Um, he's got some abilities as a blocker, but really he is a smooth and fast runner. Um, I... I um, I just, I, I'm not sure where he is. Is that it for him? Is he just really another wide receiver? I mean, they had him lined up split wide constantly. He's you know, always, if, he's, if he's basically just a wide receiver, I'd rather just get a wide receiver. Yeah, that's kind of how I feel. Uh, <laughs> I, I understand that like this would be kind of backing up that Darren Waller spot, but this is like a premium. I, I, dude, I don't know. It just he doesn't scream badass to me. Where I just I need to have him. Again, Is that kind of how you feel? Again, I think we're maybe a draft or so away from that guy being more of a luxury than right now. Yeah. Those are those are the only guys I could see going into day one. Day two. Um, this is where I feel like I see most of the talent this year. This is the second and third round. I'm gonna start. I'm I'm gonna keep this like brief because there's a lot of guys, but I'm gonna name the guys real quick. In order, the way I see them, Alabama, Cameron, Cameron Leitu, mm-hmm. Michigan, Luke Schoonmaker, Whew. Um, Penn State, Brenton Strange, somebody I ca- that caught my eye early on in the college season. I think everybody else has him lower than me. I have him up pretty high. Uh, Purdue, Payne Durham, definitely a big name, was a senior bowl guy that that caught a lot of eyes. He's got some highlight plays where he's dragging people. Miami's Will Mallory mm-hmm. and Georgia's Darnell Washington oh. and Oregon State's Luke Musgrave. Now Darnell I know Washington, I, I saw him. Uh, hang on, go go right into it. Tell me all about him. I think I've seen him in person three times. And you look at this guy; he looks like a friggin' monster. He is. That is one of the biggest definitions of men among boys I have seen. Um, you know, they had the other tight end over at Georgia also said the, I mean, everybody at Georgia is like NFL ready. You just look, you know, up and down that roster. You look at the, you know, you see an offensive line up and down. It's going to be NFL starters. And you see these two tight ends that are NFL guys. And you're just like, Jesus Christ. But, um, he's just so big. 
and just, you know, soft hands, I thought also. Um, I'm glad he's out of the SEC. I'm glad he's out of my life for, for that part of my life for sure. Well, I mean, you hit it. I mean, th- those are his two best qualities, I would say. He is very big, 6'7", 264 pounds, and he has very good soft hands. I'd say he's a very good receiver. Um, really, yeah. really good at adjusting his body, even in midair. That gigantic frame, he knows how to use all of it to go get the ball. He can twist and contort his body to bad throws by a 30-year-old quarterback. Um, <laughs> but to Twer- me... I have seen this dude rated in the first round, and I don't see that. And, you know, maybe I'm downplaying the upside here, but if I'm the Giants, their upside is hidden behind way too much development. I see, when I look at him, a rare combination of size and athleticism that played well in the SEC despite being incredibly raw. With a ton of ceiling, maybe he could develop. But where he needs to improve is literally everything. His blocking has way too much waistband for my taste. I mean, I understand that he is a large man at 6'7", that that is going to be a lot to coil up in your waist and, and, and like, you know, bend your knees. He's not bending his knees enough. He's too far forward. And I don't care. 6'7", is is huge by NFL standards, but 264 is not by NFL standards. Georgia didn't rely on their tight ends to block as much. I I don't think they did anything to really help this kid develop at all. Yeah, I mean, they had such talent in the offensive line, you know. Yeah. Over the last, you know, several years since the Kirby era has really picked up in in recruiting. And, you know, they don't have to do anything. So they, they, you know, they're going to utilize those as additional receivers and and things. And having the, the nice soft hands really helped in that case. But, I don't, I don't know how much of that is coachable and correctable as opposed to that's just natural ability. My thinking is, you know, with the right coaching staff in the right system, I think he could be, you know, a really effective NFL. I don't know if that's us. Well, that's the thing. I, I, not, not, I mean, first of all, that we have great coaching. I'm, I have no doubt that they no, could. No, 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 no. I, I know what you're saying. Knocking, I wasn't knocking our coaching staff. I was saying is, is are the we system the right situation right? for a guy like right. him to, to thrive? And that's kind of where I feel because to me, I think he could develop. I think he has the potential to develop in an all pro. I mean, not many tight ends have this natural athleticism and natural size. It's really rare. And you can't just, you can't just buy size. You got to be it. Um, But on the other hand, I think that there's a very real possibility that he just turns out to be a big lumbering doofus. His route running is not good. There's steps all over the place. It's not fluid or smooth it's rough and and bumbling and there's no polish whatsoever i I think he looks unquick in and out of breaks because i don't think he knows what he's doing i think he's a quick guy but i think when he's running routes he doesn't know or doesn't have enough practice to just really feel quick do you see a lot of guys when you're doing your draft analysis you know whether it's georgia or bama or ohio state or any of the ones that just have you know, fantastic recruiting classes every single year that because they play with such great talent around them, their technique is either undeveloped or downright sloppy because they don't need to be, you know, they don't need to spend the time on these guys to be, you know, technique perfect because they're just, they're just physical mismatches. Do you notice that more on these really, really good teams or is that just uh I notice it more on the good teams and bad conferences. Okay. Where so, like, it? does that make sense? Like, 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 Georgia is a rare case, but I don't think generally they could get away with that because they too often have to play Alabama and they have to play Florida. They, there's just too much competition for them to be just oh whatever. But I think like Oregon can get away with that. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Where it's like right. Oregon is sort of Clemson. Yeah, they're, they're they're just the class of their conference where mm-hmm. they can just get away with that. I think Clemson's a great one. That's a that's a really good example. Mm-hmm. Um, but Georgia, not typically. Uh, so basically when I run through these day two guys, that's my thoughts on Washington. I understand I'm, I, dude, I floated that opinion out there on Twitter and I got murdered. So you know what? It's, it's what I see, you know, maybe, maybe he's going to be good, but personally, I don't think this team is in the spot to take that chance. Now that I said it, we're definitely drafting him, right? Um, I'm putting it in, uh, you know, pencil and pen (laughs) magic marker time, baby. (laughs) 
Um, I was surprised at how much I liked Leitu. I, I was not thrilled to go see him at the senior board, but he was very consistent when he was down there. Fluid, mm-hmm. looks smooth, looks natural at everything he's asked to do. He's not the best at it, but he looks like he knows what he's doing. He doesn't make a fool of himself. He looks pretty good. Schoonmaker, mm-hmm. I didn't think I was going to like at all. Michigan kid, 6'5", 250, really good receiver and a good blocker. I don't really understand why he's not getting more buzz. Um, it's amazing. You said he's 6'5", 250. And what was Washington? 6'8", what? Oh, he's 6'7", 246. Yeah. Jeez, these guys are all just incredible monsters. Now. Yeah. Really it really is wild. Yeah. Um, the, the, the Penn State kid, Brenton Strange, I really like because he's a sneaky H-back. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and he's like truly an H-back. Uh, 6'3", he's much shorter than the other guys. 253. I think he's athletic. I think if you put the tape on, you really watch him. Sure, people aren't talking about him, but he looks like he is a pretty good blocker. He looks like an athletic receiver. Um, and this is this just – he feels like a Joe Shane pick, doesn't he? Like just this guy you haven't sort of really heard of, but like when you put it on, it's like, well, why the hell wouldn't you pick this guy? Yeah. <laughs> um, all the other guys, Payne Durham, you know, I like him for being a Y – tight end he can certainly block he had some really really fantastic plays at the senior bowl i would love that he certainly can drag defenders with him will mallory not a big fan of luke musgrave i could see the oregon state kid i could see him um he's 6'6 253 i could see him developing behind darren waller and that's when i would say the giants probably have their eye on as well but these guys are in my view late day two guys the day three guys i don't love them Davis Allen, Josh Wiley from Cincinnati, Davis Allen from Clemson. They have some things they can do. If they do, if this is their big move, then it's just going to reset, I would think, the, the tight end conversation for next draft, right? Yeah. Or do you think Darren – I mean, well, I, I, up, uh, assuming Darren Waller isn't perfect, right? I think, well, I, I think just the way our tenor of talking in this show, I think we are – we are a little more pessimistic than we probably need to be with him. I think we, I, I don't think he's, I don't think we traded for him with the thought that he was going to be a short term solution. I think, you know, they traded and they gave away a draft pick for him. They restructured his contract and everything to have the out in case, but I think they are, they are looking for him to be a guy who's going to be here for a few years unless, you know, unfortunate things happen. So I think we're being a little more pessimistic about him than management does it this time well yes at this time i i guess the way i view darren waller is he's 30 right so by the end of this year he's 31 if he's here next year like you said they did not trade him for a one-year thing they're hoping that he'll they'll get three of the four years out of him i would think that's it but that puts him at 33 so eventually they're they have to be drafting to replace him eventually yeah. and they think 33 is probably going to be the ceiling so it's either going to be this year or next year they have to figure out his replacement and i'm thinking again i keep using the same refrain over and over again but again with the other things that are needed that might be a decision or a move they can push back a year sure and i think it comes down to who's on the board and where they have them valued right yep. I, I i do think that if if the value isn't right they are in the position or let's say this joe shane has positioned himself to be able to pass on it until next year. Mm-hmm. Um, I I had received some... Uh, I'm curious on your thoughts because I had said simply that on Twitter. I believe that this doesn't change our draft plans, but it does allow us to pass if the value isn't right. Something along those lines. And I got feedback that this is um, what would be considered a very stacked tight end class to miss out on. And I'm curious on your thought on that. I mean, let's assume that's true, that this is a once in 10 years level of this many good tight ends coming out in one draft and we're going to pass on all of them. Do you think that that is okay? Well, that's like saying, well, you better, it's like saying you better get a a tight end this year because there won't be good guys next year. (laughs) You know, it doesn't mean that, you know, there may be a lot more, there may be more options this year than next year, but, you know, if, if we don't have the guys that are available for us when we're drafting, when we want, we're not going to reach on a position. So I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily ever worry about things like that. Like we got to, we, we're going to miss out on the great class, you know, because again, I think our board for need has higher things on it than tight end right now. Sure. I would agree with that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, for starters, corner center, 
right off the bat. Like I don't Linebacker. know. Who, yeah, yeah, I don't know who corner two and I don't know who center one is. Wide wide receiver. You know the things we've talked about a hundred thousand times. You're right, but we we're not going to draft on FOMO, basically. <laughs> no, no. I I hope not. Anyway, I I see. I agree with you, but I I do. It would be. So I agree with you, but I will say if in five years we are having tight end problems and there were some dubious draft picks in this draft class, it would certainly be a look back point where it's like, you drafted this dude instead of any of the tight ends that all turned out to be pretty functioning starters. It's certainly a note to put to the side, I would say. Yeah, but you know something in five years from now, we're talking about guys that, you know, if True. they're good, might be moving on in free agency somewhere else. Yeah, you're right. So. I can't, you I can't, are usually right. <laughs> I, can't worry, I can't worry about, you know, five years from now, I'm going to be fucking 55 years old, you know. So I might actually not have any hair on my head in five years. I, I You can't. What will you, you do then? My God, I'll look like you. I know. You'll have no one to but, make fun of. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, general managers, coaches, Five years is an eternity. You know, how many GMs will still have their jobs? Well, I was going to say, Dave Gettleman didn't last five years, did he? Yeah, I mean, I would say, when, what's the average head coach? How long does he last in his league, you know, in his job? Three years? Four years? How long oh, do really? GMs last? Maybe four or five? So you can't, the second you start worrying about your legacy and looking back on things, you're going to be looking at the classified ads for a new job and a new career, so... I guess that really puts into perspective how wild Bill Belichick is. It's really amazing. He know? was. I don't know if you you saw this. They was asked a question at the uh, the coaches and GM like meeting today. Mm-mm. Or uh, okay, so they missed the playoffs last year by like a dropped catch, pretty right. much, right? And some kid asked him was like, "What would you say to fans to give them any sort of hope for next year?" Essentially, like, I, I don't know. It was uh, obviously a more long way. <laughs> Your reaction was essentially Bill Belichick's. And then he just was like, I don't know, the last 25 years. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Insane. It's, something, it's one of the things like things we'll probably never see in our lifetime again. I think the coach that, A, has the consistency that he did. I don't care. I don't. This is not going to be a Brady versus Belichick argument, but just the consistency and also the rope given to him by ownership and the He's front office. He's GM. Yeah. To, you know, even if there is a down year or two down years, to completely ignore it and move on. So, you know, the record, how many Super Bowls? Six Super Bowls in mm-hmm. nine attempts? I don't think we're going to see a coach that's going to do that. I don't think in our in our lifetimes anymore. Just the the impatientness. I think you know this the world we live in now in, in social media and instant gratification and what have you done for me lately and you know imbecilic questions like that 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 guy asked Belichick <laughs> that the attention span and the interest. I mean, I follow Tottenham for soccer and uh, Tottenham last year made the Champions League. They lost in the in the in the uh, in the first round, the group stage for it. Coach got fired. Whoa. I mean, made the made the Champions League, you know, top four in, in the Premier League. You know, not a not a slouchy team, didn't underachieve in, in Premier League. You know, it, but there is no there's no patience anymore. There's now, now, now. So when you see when you look at Belichick's, you know, run. After failing, you know, in, in Cleveland the first time, it, it's extraordinary. Yeah, it really is wild. We, I don't, I don't we know don't... how we went wound up here, but. <laughs> <laughs> um. So this position, you would say, is probably the most important position on the field for you, right? For offense, it's like. Tight end? Um, not most important, but I would say the biggest difference between the best offenses and good offenses is the tight end on the roster, right? I would say, well, I'd say number one is quarterback. For well, sure. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and then number two, yeah, because I think, you know, almost everybody has a wide receiver one that causes, you know, who is good, can make acrobatic catches, can, you know, get the yards, runs good routes. But how many offenses really have that tight end, that guy who's, such a physical mismatch uh, you know it's 
you you have to design an offense around stopping that person, which then opens up the offense for everything else. And if this offense can get a tight, if, if Waller can be the guy who's that guy, forget about Saquon Barkley and how you're you know allowing him to have more opportunities to run in open field and open space. But you know, is the need for an elite? wide receiver one as as critical because you have this monster over the middle so to me it's one of those if you get it right with tight end it's it makes your offense unique and it makes it so much harder to defend yeah i i I think when you start thinking about the best tight ends in the league like it's a pretty short list yeah um so yeah, I, I think if you can get yourself one of those and set yourself in a position to continue to have one of those for years to come, it, it certainly adds a dimension to the offense. That I, I think, like you said, it's harder to defend. I mean, everyone's got a corner to handle wide receiver one. They have a defensive scheme to handle it. But what they can't handle or what makes it a lot harder is, you know, you have yourself a wide receiver one that causes problems. You have yourself a running back that is arguably top five in the league. You have a quarterback that can throw really well, but also can run just as fast as Lamar Jackson, I guess, in a straight line, supposedly. (laughs) Um, But then you throw in there a tight end that safeties have trouble guarding. And and you have an offense that scores points. Um, Last year, I think we scored over 30 points only twice. Once was against the Colts and the other was against the Vikings in the playoffs, right? The, the, the two things this offense needs to do is, you know, and, they, and they're related, is obviously score more points and have more bigger explosive plays. Yeah. And having mismatches like a tight end, like Waller, who can exploit people that are covering him, not only will it open up more explosive plays for him, but opens – you know, it loosens up the offense for guys like Saquon Barkley to have more explosive plays too. This offense is not going to score 30 points a game if it has to grind its way down the field. No, oh. you know, three, three plays for 10 yards, playing every, you know, to move the chains, move the chains, move the chains. Besides that being boring football, it's just they're not good enough for it for starters. They're not good enough to execute that, and that's not you know when the other team is not playing that way, and they're bombs away, and they're, you know, look at Philly when they play us, they beat us because they jumped out to leads really quickly on, boom 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 boom, right, you know, Dallas would like to do that also, you know, all these teams, you know, teams that were. The, the elite teams, the, the the Kansas cities out there, you know, that they're all trying to do that. So, you know, we don't have the talent to be a grinder and we're not going to, we're not going to win a snail's race when we're running against rabbits. Well put. All right. Last question. And then we're going to end this one is how excited are you for the Darren Waller acquisition? If it works out, you know, very, because I know I've said it on this show for weeks on end and, you know, for seasons on end that I love having an explosive tight end. You know, I, because of the cranky wife, I watch a lot of 49er games. You know, we, we see Kansas city on, on primetime almost every week. We saw how the, how the Cowboys would crush us. We we've seen, you know, I remember having, as you referenced before, the Mark Bavaro's, uh, you know, watching Tony Gonzalez, those are oh. guys that are few and far between. And not only is how good they are, how they just create chaos for defenses. And if we have one of those, it will make our offense better quicker than having to build all the other pieces that we need. So I just hope that he, what do they call it? The, uh, the cryogenic chamber or whatever. So he has all of his health. <laughs> and, you know, hopefully this new turf they're putting in to the Meadowlands doesn't fuck up his knees or his hamstrings or whatever. Or and any uh, part of him, his skull, nothing. <laughs> yeah, his pecker, I don't know anything <laughs> make him better. Just be healthy because if he is healthy, that may go down if we look back at the year and if we go further in the playoffs, it could be what was the off-season transaction of the year could be that trade. That would be something. All right, everyone, we will have something special on the horizon soon. 
Um, <laughs> <laughs> no you defined date is, yet, but great. it is going to be pretty cool. I'm really excited to to put that out there. Oh um, yeah. Oh, I know what you're talking about now. Yeah, I'm very excited about this. Um, but we don't have a definite date on that yet. Probably going to be sometime next week or the week after. So next time we will see you will be the same time next week, Tuesday well, also, morning. If you can't get enough of us, we made a guest appearance on another program. Oh, North. true. Yeah, we were, the the New York Giants rush guys had us on. Uh, Craig and Danny uh, had us on just before we did this. So that was live. Uh, so that's also if you want us to talk more shit, that's where you can find us. <laughs> that's out there. Yeah, I, I think it's on YouTube. I guess. I mean, they, they yeah, record them and stuff. But uh, yeah, great talking with those guys. We talked all about just uh, we the, talked draft, the off season, talked, really. You no know, needs. We talked just say the programs how much i hate danny cannell all sorts of things it was a lot of fun it was a lot of fun i like those guys yeah they're great um but until then we will see you at the normal time uh for our next (laughs) position wrap up which is going to be the offensive line and we're going to group the whole thing together because right because tackles are not going to be a major focus for us uh i agree yeah i think we're pretty good with that you know and we want to also remind everybody that uh Yes, we record uh, Michael <laughs> Tauber every Monday night. <laughs> so that I means you, Tuesday mornings. Yes, yes, I know. We love you. Thank you so much for always listening to us. But he always asks, when's a new show coming out on Monday afternoon? And it's like we record on Monday nights every Tuesday morning in your Just key. a couple or, more hours, buddy. Yeah, just hang on, man. I know you're jonesing for us. <laughs> I promise Tuesday morning we will be there for you. So, But thank you, uh, you know. We really oh, seriously, appreciate you listening. Yeah. yeah. Um, thank you always for listening. And uh, if you're ready for the next episode, iTunes, uh, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, on all those things. Uh, so we'll see you then next week for an offensive line preview. Until then, go Giants. Go Giants.